So nobody really should need to stand. That's, that's just not necessary. Come on, chair. No, I'm okay. <laughs> Okay, come on in, please. You can sit down. Now the rules are you can go anytime you need to. You can stay. We have plenty of room so you can stay as long as you like. Um, coach understands if you get up to go, you have other things to do today and classes to take and teach and things. Um, we'll, uh, the coach will answer any questions you like. I will call on you, though, because I want to make sure we distribute the wealth around the room and that kind of stuff. Please come in. There's no need to stand, truly. Okay. Anybody want to kick it off? Yes. Uh, say, actually, when you stand up, say who you are, your name, and who you are a little bit, so we kind of know where you're coming from. Hi, Coach Wynn. Thanks for uh, this time. Um, my name's Mitch. Do you think that money is a proper motivator, and do you think that the kind of money that the pro athletes make nowadays, has that ruined the game? Well, I said earlier that I think the two things most difficult to cope with are too much and too little. And I think that as far as the salaries that are, they're making today, I don't think it's conducive to the best uh, uh, play or, best, or conducive to the best interest of the sport as a whole. So I think it is difficult, but you certainly can't blame them, can you? You can't blame them for taking it. Um, I think, as I've said, that uh, they're overpaid. Uh, uh, no question in my mind that they're overpaid. Uh, and I got in trouble not too long ago when I made the statement, and now I'll stick up for it. I've said that coaches, for the most part, are overpaid. I've said that I didn't think any coach should be making more money than the president of the university, and I'm not sure they should be making any more than the head of any department. But I said that when I was teaching, so I'm not. But do I blame the coaches for taking it? Absolutely not. I'd have taken it if they offered it to me, but, uh, <laughs> but they didn't. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I think that uh, it can be a, a motivating factor up to a certain degree, and then I became, I think it becomes detrimental, but it can be motivating up to a, a, a certain degree. I was wondering, in terms of a coach, someone that could get the most out of their players and now the most of who they have, who do you think is the greatest coach in college basketball, either before or present? Uh, some present company excluded. <laughs> <laughs> some probably that we've never heard of, you or I. They're probably out in some place where they don't get the type of material. They're not in the limelight, but they possibly are becoming closer to getting more potential out of what they have than some of these that are in the limelight. You know. Uh, Sir Thomas Gray, in his Gray's Gray Elegy, says that to full many a gem of purest ray serene, the deep unfathomed caves of ocean bear, full many a flower was born to blush unseen, the waste of sweetness on the desert air, just as beautiful as some that others see, but nobody sees them. And I think that's true of many, many teachers, uh, not just of sports, but in other areas that are doing a tremendous job, but they're not in the limelight. They're not in the areas where that they're going to get recognition, but they're doing a great job. Uh, so um, the ones that are doing the great job, I don't know. Say, say your name. My name's Arnold. I'm Ashley's father, one of your students. Oh, right. <laughs> okay, nice to Coach, uh, in your uh, college coaching career, have you ever experienced anything uh, similar to the uh, situation with the Lakers and Kobe and Shaq and Phil Jackson had? And if you did or didn't have that experience, how would you handle it? Well, first of all, you don't handle people, you know. You handle things. You work with people. You mean how I would work with them? Okay. How do you handle the, the team conflicts that have occurred? In, uh, well, you're working with people then. You're not handling them. You're working with people again. Uh, yes, I had that happen. Uh, I recall in one particular situation where I uh, almost put two players on the plane to come back from New York City when they were a little bit... Uh, 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 You'll tell us who they are. Won't no. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but um, uh, it's only natural that youngsters uh, want recognition, and it, if someone's getting more 
than uh, than much more than they are. That, that, that can happen. I, I think um, I think one of Phil Jackson's great assets has been not just getting Kobe and uh, and Shaquille working together. I think that was going to come along. I think getting the rest of the players to accept the fact that Kobe and and uh, Shaquille are going to get that. So accept that and fill your role and do the best you can. Uh, but I, I, I think you're likely to have something similar to that, whatever <clears throat> you have is some uh, players or individuals that are uh, uh, getting a, a much more uh, publicity and recognition than others. I, I think you get it in the business world. There's a lot of people that get an advancement. I don't know why it should have been me instead of that guy. I've, I've seen that over and over. And, uh, so you're going to have a certain amount of that. You just got to uh, accept it. And, and um, uh, as the individual and those in charge of it, uh, you have to get them. That's maybe be your difficult job is to get, get the others to accept that, that situation and still work uh, for the welfare of the group as a whole. And that, that's maybe the most difficult job, yes. But we, we, I had it on occasion. So I, but um, you're working with it, you've got to talk to them and say, you might not even be here if it wasn't for them, you know. Um, Coach, the, the turnover rate in uh, college athletics is very fast with incoming freshmen and transfer students and graduate seniors. Did you do anything to build uh, team conflict or team cohesion being as uh, the makeup of your team is ever changing? Well, I think just the normal things of making everyone feel needed and wanted. We all, we all need to be needed. We all feel to be wanted. If we're, we're not given the feeling we're not needed or not wanted, that's not good. So you, you uh, uh, I think uh, just the effort you'd make to make everyone. I used to equate the uh, kid. I used this on a kid. Not, not. It might be once a great while when you're having a, a something where you think it's necessary. I would equate you with a powerful automobile. Now let's say the, uh, there's a powerful engine. That's Kareem. That's Al Cinder. You're just a wheel. And you're just a nut holding that wheel on. Now, which is the most important? Which can we do without? None. So you're very important. So accept your role and do the best you can in that role. Aspire for a better role, of course. I will get ready and then perhaps my chance will come. But if you're not ready, you're just whining all the time. <laughs> no, it's likely not to come. And if you have uh, situations where you can't get that across, get rid of them. Get that bad apple out of the barrel. And you're, you're, you're not going to lose much when you do that. You're going to gain. You, be, you lose a little, but you gain in the long run. Somebody else? Uh, yes. My name is Blake, and I just wanted to know, it's, at some schools, how would you deal with bad sportsmanship? How would you deal with bad sportsmanship? With players, I'd put them on the bench. That's the bad way to do it. Just don't let them play. But at school, there is no bench. What? <laughs> <laughs> what is it? At school, there is no bench. <laughs> well, I'd find a corner for him to stand in. <laughs> Actually, you don't uh, don't uh, don't go along with bad sportsmanship, whatever it might be, um, but different ways. But remember, as I said um, earlier, everyone is different, and what might be work with one individual might not be the best to use with another. And you've got to analyze the people under your supervision, and determine the best for your ability, knowing that you're imperfect, but determine your best ability what uh, action should be taken. It doesn't mean it be the same for everybody. Even for the same offense, it might might be the same for some things. It might be, but they're not in everything. For those of you who are stuck out in the hall, come on in. Please come in. There's no need to be out there. This is an informal session. We have lots of chairs here. We can stand the disruption. It's okay. Don't pass up the opportunity. And for the uh, youth of Franklin School, if you'd like to come up here, you're welcome to. If you can see better, we'd love to have you. If you want to stay there, that's fine too. Okay. Um, oh. uh, I was wondering if uh, there are any lessons that you learned from uh, Ward Lambert, the coach at Purdue, or being in the U.S. Navy.
maybe uh, help you throughout your collegiate basketball. Learn from whom? Oh, my my college coach, Ward Pickett-Abbott, uh, had highest principles as anyone I've ever known. I've never known a coach or anyone not in the uh, the coaching or teaching, but they had the higher principles than, than Mr. Lambert. I could uh, cite many examples of that, but uh, uh, yes, I, I think uh, I, I learned much from him. I think as far as the basketball, I think he was ahead of his time. As I as as the years progressed and I learned more and more about the game, I look back and I, I think he definitely was ahead of his time in many ways. But his main thing is the heart of my pyramid as far as teaching basketball is to get them in the best possible condition to make them play, uh, to teach them not only properly to quickly execute the fundamentals and make them to play as a team. And if they didn't want to play as a team, go to the bench. And uh, I, I think that uh, I think that was his uh, uh, philosophy then and uh, I think it worked very well for him. Yes. What books or what are your favorite books that have influenced your coaching philosophy over the years? Um, uh, I, I can't name a favorite ones, uh, really. There, there are many. You learn certain things from one, certain things from another. At the end of each season, when I was at UCLA, uh, a couple of weeks after the season was over, I took some aspect of the game, some of uh, it's fundamental and researched it. I'd get every book, uh, any of the quality books that I thought were from people that I thought knew what they were talking about, uh, and 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 study. I mean, it might be rebounding, and I'd get different ideas. And then from all these, I'd make one composite out of all. You know, if someone had something that, that I thought he was uh, uh, very successful in this particular aspect that was different from others, then I wanted to know about, more about it. And I wanted to talk to him more about it and try to act him per personally. And um, I think uh, I, I think doing something like that helped me uh, more than just reading one book or two. I wanted to get a composite feeling of what a lot of them that I felt were proficient in the particular area that I was studying would feel, and then then come up to one uh, uh, final thing of it. I think that helped me uh, more than anything else. But there there are a number of good books out there, and and not not just the ones by the name coaches. There's a lot of others that. That aren't named coaches yet. I, I would advise beginning coaches to uh, uh, teaching in, in, say, the high schools or, or in a scholastic or some level, get Morgan Wooten's books. Now, that's a high school coach from uh, Hyattsville, uh, Paul, uh, from Baltimore. Uh, what's it? Well, what's, it, what's the name? I can't think of the name of the school now. He's a man named Morgan Wooten, and his books are good. He's a great teacher. He's a great teacher. And, and his players are fundamentally sound, and they all go to college, and, and uh, they do well. Actually, there was a second part to the question by Nick, and that was, did you learn something from the Navy um, oh. th that helped you in your coaching when you were in the service? <coughs> I think I learned more about what not to do from the Navy <laughs> than about what to do. I don't know how we ever won a war. I, I, I don't know. I, re, I really. I'm sent to a training carrier as an engineering officer. I don't want an engineer. I know more an engineering officer than you are. And I just talked to him. I was smart enough to talk to the chief, and he said, stay out of my way. You know as much as the guy preceded you. The preceded you. But, um, but there, there are certain things you ought to learn in any group activity, what's necessary. Uh, uh, and I, I got put on report one time uh, on the ship because uh, because I, I didn't go to the front of the line and going to the ship's store to get something. There were a bunch of enlisted men in front of me and the officer, the, the executive officer said, go to the front of the line. And I said, no, uh, I'm in no hurry. And some of these men were. And I got to so I said, go to the front of the line. And I said, I'm in no hurry, sir. I, I, I'm in no hurry. Said, You're on report. He sent me in to the captain. So I went to see the captain. And the captain said, um, uh, Commander, so and so, I won't give his name. He said that uh, he uh, put you on a report here. Uh, what about this? And I told him what it was. And he said, uh, he gets a little carried away, doesn't he? <laughs> he says he's like a lot of the other 90 day wonders. <laughs> give him a little authority. And, hmm. So, but that, that was, that's unusual. That, that was just unusual. But, but you, have, you do learn that. 
to get things done, there has to be discipline in the group as a whole. It's, I learned that, yes. You've got to work together. You have to be discipline. Pablo, come on in. Anybody up there wants to sit up here, please do. Um, somebody else? Yes. Uh, say not only your name, but where you're kind of from, so we can know. Okay. Um, I'm Christina. I'm a student in the class, and I also write for the Daily Burn Sports section. And I was wondering um, what you think about all the attention that athletes, both uh, college and professional, get from the media. Well, the bad ones get more attention than the good ones. But I think that's uh, true in uh, all the, uh, the uh, newspaper business today and whatnot. Much, they play up with the bad. And uh, I, I think, I think uh, probably uh, too much. Uh, I think athletics are a very important thing in our society. I think they are in the schools. I think they serve a very important purpose. But like, uh, I never want the athletes here at UCLA or any place to feel that I'm here to play football or basketball or, or baseball or whatever it is. You're here to get an education. That's the others are, are the just extra curricular things that you're fortunate to be a part of. In many cases, is paying your way. Appreciate it, and uh, don't feel you have it coming to you though, because I don't think you do. It's like uh, there's talk about paying the athletes. No way. No way. They are paid. Uh, the, if they get a full scholarship, it covers all essentials, just essentials. But you're going to have some time to work. And sometimes, as Mr. Lincoln said, the worst thing you can do for the, those you love are the things they could and should do for themselves. Do our athletes here have to run for classes? You have to run for classes, don't you, most of you? Do they have to? You get them pre-enrolled. They know how to get jobs? No, you get them summer jobs for them. You get them for them. They have to, how about tutoring? They, you, they have to run down tutors? No, you get tutors for them. Who pays for them? You pay for them. And, and all those things. Uh, so uh, I say they should, and that, I think that part is all right, as long as it's being on the educational part of it, yes. But uh, now the other thing, I think that, uh, that um, paying for, paying, get an extra, no. If you pay for an athlete, you've got to pay every athlete. You've got to pay every athlete. I don't care what the sport is, I don't know what the gender is. You've got to pay every athlete. And I think you'd have to pay them the same amount. And uh, in spite of their saying they're making so much money, not many athletic programs throughout the country are in the black. As a sports writer, you probably checked a little bit on that, and uh, uh, not many, many schools in the country, their athletic programs are in the black. Yes. I'm wondering if you have some hints or what your experience was balancing the commitment necessary to coach a championship team with the, the demands of raising a family. You've got to establish your own priority. I think family, I think faith should be first in one's life. I think family should be second. And I think uh, I've said in the book, the three F's, uh, faith, family, and friends. Uh, but I'd say, let's include the friends in there and say profession. But I think the I think the faith and the, and the family comes ahead of profession. Now, there are certain things that you have to arrange and work out, yes. But I, I, think, I think it can be done. And uh, I think that uh, you hear the statement, you their statement, you, uh, some fellows get so, uh, so uh, involved in making a living they forget to make a life. And I think that's true. I think that's true of coaches. It can be, and I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's necessary at all. I think it can be done. How many grandchildren and great-grandchildren do you have, Coach? Nellie and I, and I beget two children. Our two children beget seven grandchildren. Five of our grandchildren at this particular time have beget ten great-grandchildren, and they're not holding. Coach Wooden, are you familiar at all with the film or the person Rudy? Yes, I saw Rudy. And in the class you'd mentioned that you'd take a talented player over a person who's very motivated, but at the same time, don't you feel at all that a person who's motivated, such as Rudy, has a role on the team that helps to positively influence and affect the behaviors of fellow teammates? If you can have a Rudy, that's fine. <laughs> yes, you can do that with a Rudy. I mean, Rudy's round. You know, but no, uh, uh, you have to, 
no, you can't win without material. You can't. Some can do better than others, because coaches aren't the same any more than the talent. There's the talent's not the same, players aren't the same building, neither are coaches, but no coach ever won very much without the talent. Not, not, not every coach wins with it, I'll say that, because coaches aren't all the same, but not, no one, no one, absolutely no one wins without it, and in spite of what some of them may think. Uh, they don't. So, I, yes, I know I have talent, but you like motivation of that type in certain individuals. Of course, and that helps. I've, I had, I've had some that way, uh, that uh, they, weren't, uh, they, they weren't talented as individuals, but their work ethic was so good and they had such a good influence on the, on the squad as a whole that you keep them. And they may not contribute in playing time, but they're going to contribute in other ways. There's other ways to which can contribute. Once you retire, coach, did you ever think about returning back to coaching? <laughs> when I, uh, just this last year, when I, uh, just for the final four, when I was back in Durham, and, and uh, Mike Krzyzewski asked me to come over and, and speak to his team, and uh, this was just the day before they left for the final four, uh, and uh, watch him have a practice. <laughs> <laughs> I felt the urge. <laughs> Uh, I love practices. That's the part I always loved about teaching. And uh, but no, as far as coming, wanting to come back, I've never had that feeling. I was approached a little bit, and uh, a year or two after, I was if I wouldn't come back to certain places just on an interim basis for something. Or, but no, I wasn't uh, in, interested at all. Uh, but I do do. Uh, I do miss the practice. I still do. I'd like to. I'd like to. Conduct practices. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, honored to be here. I'm from Fresno, California. My name is Fred. I've a long time been a co college or a collegiate sports fan, and I was wondering if you had any opinions now on the disruption of college programs by professional sports, particularly basketball. Yes, but they they, they can't help it. The, the the professionals like the, the basketball, and the NBA. They liked it very much when uh, uh, they were restricted to, uh, uh, to getting anybody that hadn't finished four years of high school. They liked it better, and they'd like it better today, but by law, you can't do that. And I think it's up to the uh, coaches uh, uh, to try to teach the youngsters the value of the education, do the best you can. Uh, but just still, some of it's going to happen, and I don't think it's wrong in every case. I think it's wrong in the vast majority of the cases. The education is going to be very meaningful to you all your life. After you get out of school, uh, basketball, football, baseball, that's not going to be meaningful for, but for a very, very, very minute uh, percentage. And even those, it'll only be for a comparatively a small number of years of the rest of their life. So, um, but I think it's up to the, uh, the, the coaches and some of the other advisors to come in the college level to, to get across to the youngsters under supervision the importance of education. I, 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 I'm frankly more proud of the fact that my, my 27 years at UCLA and two years at Indiana State University that, that I think only about seven or eight of my athletes failed to graduate and get their degrees. Now I'm not talking about everybody that came off the team, I'm talking about all that made the team and I'm very proud of that. Uh, that's why they're there for, and I, I, I wanted my players to always feel that's why they're there for. I wanted, I wanted their education to be number one. I wanted basketball to be second because they're paying for your education. Third, you have to have some social activities, but if you permit social activities to take precedence over either of the other two, you're going to be out of here. And, and uh, try to get that across uh, uh, to them. And um, I, I'm very fortunate. I had a lot of honor students, many, many honor students. I'm very proud of that. Actually, you were talking about where some of your players are today in terms of careers. Why don't you share that? This is well, rather impressive. From the time I came, there's over 30 of my players became attorneys. Uh, I think it's 11 dentists and uh, 10 doctors and uh, eight ministers. Uh, some of them became ministers after a while, like Willie Knowles. Uh, he he'd, uh, finished college, uh, had a nice pro career, and some years afterwards he decided he wanted to come here. So, so he's in the 50s, he started and he went to seminary, and you now he's an active minister. And then uh, 
many, many teachers, and, and, and a lot of just, uh, I, I would say more of my players than my years here majored in business of some form or another than all other uh, uh, majors combined, and many of them are in that. And, uh, but there's, there's others. I think only one engineer, a few actors, and uh, some of them in other professions, but they're still actors. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I had a question. I was, um, how would you react today? Uh, I think it was touched on by somebody else about the uh, players uh, organizing because they want a greater share of the revenue that they were generated from uh, the uh, NCAA tournament and all the money that's being generated. And if you can put yourself in a picture as uh, a coach today, making maybe a seven million, uh, a million dollar contract and a shoe contract. How would you react to these players, uh, especially if they tried to organize, you know, the other players saying we want more? I'd sure like to have been in that position. <laughs> <laughs> Al McGuire once said, he'll coach pro, you've got to pay me more than you're paying any of the players. But so, uh, um, well, you'd be getting a million dollars. I don't believe in, in giving in to pressure. I don't believe in that. You know, there may be times you have to, and maybe I couldn't get along in it because I wouldn't do that. It's just like um, if I had a player under contract and uh, he didn't make, uh, had a good year and demanded renegotiation, I wouldn't do it. And, and that, that probably couldn't be. I couldn't hold the position because I wouldn't do it. And uh, um, you're probably losing, but I, I, I wouldn't do it. Now, on the other hand, I would try to reward someone with excessive or excellent performance. I'd try to reward them, but I wouldn't. If they demand renegotiation, absolutely not. That's you, you fill your contract, and then we'll do that. I believe in filling out the contract. I was talking on the college level today with the players organizing uh, these unions, trying to get a, uh, a bigger share of the pie because they generate most of the money. They feel they generate it, not the program. Well, they're self-important. They're not. They, 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 they're not. There's, there, there's no such thing to me as a minor sport. There's, there's, there are income-producing sports and not income-producing. Now, the ones that we do in that would be, your, in most cases, would be football or basketball players, correct? Right. Because they're generating most of the income. And they're just dead burned selfish. So that's because we, uh, the other sports are just important, too. And just because you're income-producing and, and, and others are non-income-producing. So, now, I know and the non-income-producing sports should understand that they better support the income producing sports because they're, if, if, if they have to cut, they're going to cut the, the non-income producing sports. And, and that's natural and they have to understand that. So the non-income producing sports should, should certainly be hoping all the time that the, in, the income producing sports do very well because that's going to help them. And, um, uh, but um, I, I don't, I don't, I, uh, yes, from those areas, uh, uh, I, I I wouldn't give in to him. Coach, you just made three people very happy in the room. The two <laughs> women uh, members of the crew team and a male lacrosse player here. Any of the other women I, I, lacrosse I, players here today? I've always felt that way. To me, I to me I. Oh I, right, there you go. Uh, Ken. Yeah, Ken Revisa from Cal State Polar Day. Coach Wood, thank you so much for sharing yourself with us today. And my question, um, if you feel comfortable sharing this, in talking with the Duke team before they were going to the Final Four, that little, what were some of the things you talked with them about as they're getting ready to go off? I commended them uh, on their being at a fine university, which I think is one of the finest, and uh, uh, their play that had brought them there. and. Uh, um, um, I just wish them luck in the tournament, and uh, um, that's about it, just general terms of that sort. Uh, I, I, it, it's, I, I'm pleased to see a university like Duke. Uh, I think the, I like to see them do well because I think it is one of the one of the very fine universities, and uh, not that all are good, but there's some that you have special feelings about, and I, I, I think it's one. It pleases me to see the Ivy League schools do well. I'm, I'm pleased to see them. She likes them because I know that they're, they are tremendous academic. And first, and 
So is UCLA. <laughs> One other question in relation to what you said earlier about how much you enjoyed practice. Um, what would be some things if you were to talk about quality practice and what goes into that from a psychological perspective? What would be some things you'd talk about? Start on time, close on time, close on a high note, uh, have it carefully organized so you don't waste any time, move quickly from one drill to another, have everyone, uh, other people working with you, whether it be assistant manager, I mean, knowing what's coming up, have a have a, I was called a three by five man because I had little cards that the managers had, assistants had, and I had, and we moved quickly. When I blew the whistle, I wanted everybody to stop right now and not take another shot or two or do this or that. They stop and I, I tell them what the next drill is, and they know where they're going to go to run organized uh, so you can get more done in less time. And I wanted the players to know that they will not keep them over. They will start, uh, we'll, uh, uh, Start, we'll start on time and we'll stop on time. I had three rules that I stuck with almost in, in my entire, in my early years of teaching, I had a number of rules and a few suggestions. My latter years, I had a few rules and a lot of suggestions. But, uh, the, and, I, and I learned not to say what the, uh, what the penalty would be. Um, when originally I always said yes, that I, I saw no gray area, and there is a gray area. I didn't see that in my earlier years, but I learned about that. But three rules I stuck with on time. My players that practiced had to be there on time. And when I say be there on time, that means they're dressed and on the floor, not coming in and putting their shoes on or something as they're dragging down on the floor. They had to be dressed and on the floor at a certain time or they didn't get to practice. Now, could there be exceptions? Of course. Now, well, there was a time when I didn't think there was, but there is. There could be some reason why. Maybe a professor kept them late. I hope that would be the reason. Um, but there could be a legitimate reason about them. Otherwise, they had to come to you and give you the reason, and you determine whether they're going to get to practice. If they don't get to practice, they're missing playing time. You make that very clear to them. And the next was then, not one word of profanity. I would not tolerate a word of profanity. On the floor, you're off the floor for the day. But when they come back the next day, don't say, you better not do that again. Don't do that with your own children. When they do things, don't say, you better not do that again. They do it again, take action. But take action when they first do it. I believe in that very much. And the third one was never criticize a teammate. That's the teacher's job. That's the coach's job. That's, that's his job. Don't you do it. You can talk with them about things, yes, but don't be critical. And you can be critical without saying a word. You can be critical by a look in other ways, in some way. Don't, don't, so none of that. And I wouldn't tolerate that. Uh, and those are the things that I stuck to uh, uh, pretty close. Uh, one of my great players, one of the greatest I've ever had, Okay, well, I, there was a time when I demanded when we traveled, we had they, they had to wear uh, uh, slacks and jackets, and, and uh, then uh, with our chancellor coming and uh, the nylons and, and her turtlenecks, I thought, well, maybe we're going too far. So all I required in my latter years is you be clean and neat, just be clean, neat. One of my players, one of my great players, came not very clean, neat, and I wouldn't let him on the bus. I said, you can't go with us. You, you, you can get to the airport on your own. You better get back and get cleaned up if you want to go. Otherwise, you just stay at home. He got there. He cleaned up. So, but and I suppose I'd let him get by with it. And I'm in trouble with everybody. And um, so you, if you have a rule, stick to it. But be careful about the rules you make. And, and don't, don't uh, uh, in advance tell what the punishment will be. Because there could be extenuating circumstances. At the time, I didn't see that. But um, I hope I learned things as I went along. I know science says it's what you learn after you know it all that really matters. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Robert Lander, nice here. to have lunch with you. Thanks. Very See nice. you. Bye bye. Rob Lander, Cal State I was just wondering uh, what, importance, what importance did your first 11 years at, at the high school level have with the uh, the rest of your coaching career and what kind of things you learned there that you carried on throughout your whole coaching career? Tremendous. Tremendous. Uh, I think I learned more in my teaching, my first year of teaching out of college. My first year of teaching, I learned more than in any other one year. I, I hope I earned every year, I learned something every year, but more that very first year, I, I didn't realize what I didn't know. 
Uh, not that I thought I knew it all, but I found out I, <laughs> there's so much I didn't know. That, and uh, so I learned many things. Uh, among those things is practice organization. I learned about uh, there is a gray area. Uh, I had a, for just to, I'll give you one example on that. I had a rule that one smoking and you're off the team for the year, off the team. Well, right in the middle of the year, I caught my very best player and the only center I had smoking. And I said, that's it, off the year, off the, all right, he quit school, he didn't graduate, he was going to graduate, get a scholarship and go to school. I think I was wrong. I thought I was right at the time, but in retrospect, when I think so, I think it was wrong. I should have, I should have worked that out in some other other way. Well, I, I think I learned as time went by about those. Things. I didn't want to be like the, the, the coach who, uh, who had a rule of that sort, and he caught him and spoke, and he said, I, that's it, you know, did you know I had that rule? And the player said, yes, I did. I said, did you really understand? They said, yes, I did. Well, how come you're smoking? He said, I've been smoking since I was, uh, you know, 10 or 11 years old. He said, I didn't know that. They said, if you'd cut that out so quickly, it might be harmful to your health. So we'll <laughs> overlook it this time. So I didn't want to be like that either, but uh, uh, yes, I, I think I, I think I learned much. I think I think I was a much better uh, collegiate coach because of the experience that I'd had in 11 years of high school, and I would have been if I'd have gone right in too. Uh, to, I think I was able to do a better job, much better job than if I'd have gone directly into it. I'm just curious, you've kind of talked about it and learning from failures. What do you think the greatest lesson that you've learned, what do you think is the greatest lesson that you've learned from any particular failures that you've had? From any what? From any particular failure or mistakes that you've oh. made. Well, I, I mentioned one there, uh, you know, about dismissing that individual. Uh, and uh, um, Having ironclad rules and not seeing gray areas, I think I learned that. I, I had another thing happen to me in high school, and I had a, in, in high school, your athletes, um, uh, to earn a letter. And, and in my day, I don't think it's so important anymore, but in my day, back in the 30s, teaching high school, earning a letter really meant something. It did back in Indiana. It really meant kids loved them, and the girl friends of the players, they loved them too. They loved those letter sweaters. And uh, uh, we had certain regulations. Well. Uh, there was a player that uh, uh, didn't qualify. He didn't have earn, 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 didn't qualify. Now the coach had the option of recommending someone to the board, and if uh, almost, I, I think I never knew the board to refuse somebody that the coach. Is, uh, and, but uh, this one player, uh, he didn't qualify. But in all probability, in all probability, I was going to recommend him for a letter. So one day I'm in my homeroom, we had homerooms, and his dad came and uh, uh, asked if I'd come out and talk to him. So I'm out in the hall and he says, is my boy going to get a letter? And I said, well, I haven't made up my mind on that. As you know, he didn't qualify as far as the, the, the uh, things we have that for which you have to wait. He didn't meet it. And I said, I haven't called. He said, he better get a letter. And I said, well, I have made up my mind. He said, if he doesn't get a letter, I'll have your job. I said, let's go outside. I was young then. <laughs> I, was, I was young then. And, uh, but you know, I ended up, I didn't give that fellow a letter. I'm sorry. I'm as sorry about that as anything I've ever done. I didn't give the boy a letter because of his dad. That's not right. That's not right. And I've regretted that all my life. And that happened in my comparably early, early days. So I learned. I learned from that. That's, that's another. Uh, thing that I, uh, that I learned in life. But m many things in different different areas uh, you learn as you go along. And you'll always be imperfect. Yes. <coughs> Hi, my name's Elisa and I'm in the class and I was wondering um, how have you not let success get to your head or make you a conceited or arrogant person? Well, I hope I'm not. I hope it hasn't affected me. I hope I'm no different than, than when we ever first won a, a, a championship. And I think more than anything else, if that is true, I think it came from my parents in my early uh, teaching. I know Dad and my brothers, very big icons from there. You're no better than anybody else, but you're as good as anybody else. 
you know better, which is good. And that, that dad was pretty, pretty strict on that. And uh, I, I hope I was able to. I, I've been pleased, and there have been occasions that people have said Johnny was no different after he won championships than he was before, and that pleases me. I hope it's true. Um, um, I don't know. I just think maybe if it is true, it's because of the early uh, training that I had from uh, my parents. And, uh, um, I don't like things like legends. I don't like things like wizards. I don't like that. I, I, I don't like to say great coach. I, I said one of the better coaches. I'd like to. I'd like to be considered one of the better coaches. But say you're the best. No, no, no. I don't like that. I don't, I don't think it's right. It's not, not. I'm not being modest when I saw that. I don't. That's not. That's not being modest. I just, I'm. I'm as critical of being a, 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 a false modesty as I am of, 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 of lack of to be. I'm as fair as one or the other. I hope it's not there. Yeah. You, you know, your critics are always going to feel. You're always going to have it. Yeah. Yeah. From your critics, you can't. Can't let that bother you. I'm Robin Schofield. I work as a, a staff psychologist at um, University Counseling Center, hired by the athletic department to see student athletes in psychological services across town. <laughs> you have a tough job, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, so, just to give you the context of some of my questions, one, the first one was. Um, how did you, do you have any um, reflections or philosophies around intervening in interpersonal conflict between teammates? I, I've heard you say that when there was poor sportsmanship, um, and, I, and I heard your rule about not criticizing a teammate, you know. but mm -hmm. um, it gets complicated in athletic departments. They're small, um, and there's, there can be a lot of conflict on teams interpersonally. Do you have any, Thoughts or reflections about that? When, when to get involved, when not to, mm -hmm. that kind of thing? Uh, certainly, that's a problem that's going to exist. I don't think there's any way of uh, getting around it. Is it going to be existing at times? But, um, and it, it, maybe it's existing, say, with two individuals. They're different individuals, and what will work with one may not work with the other. So I think one of your big jobs is uh, analyzing all those that are under your supervision and trying to determine the best for your ability what will be more successful in uh, uh, terminating the, the, the situation. And that would be different. And uh, uh, um, talk with them individually. Uh, perhaps occasions bring them together and other times no each one individually maybe eventually you're going to bring them together but certainly not uh, originally generally speaking <laughs> knowing there's always going to be exceptions because of the personalities of of those involved i would say that one of the most successful teams i had at ucla the players uh, they, they, they weren't fond of each other too, too much. But on the floor, I think uh, critics felt that that team worked together about as well as any team I ever had. And yet we had one player that was a starter that hardly anybody liked. Mm -hmm. We had another one that uh, had a buddy. And outside of that one buddy, uh, neither one of them were too popular with the rest of the team. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we had uh, two players that everybody liked. You, you just, and if I didn't like them, there was really something wrong with them. They all had they had missed fights with each other. But on the baseball diamond, they were perfect as far as the double play is concerned. Though it can be. Uh, I, they, they must have had, this was even before my time, they must have had respect for each other and what the things that they were doing. So I think that's, that's the item that you have to try to get across that you can have respect without liking. I, I've said, uh, maybe as there might be people here who might not like hear that, uh, of this. And, I, and I'm not a great proponent of professional basketball, but I do watch it. Uh, this great player for uh, Philadelphia, Iverson. I don't like him. 
I don't like him at all, but I have tremendous respect for him. I think he is a great player, but I don't like him. I don't like, uh, I don't like that tattoos all up and down him all over. <laughs> I, don't <like> those. <laughs> I don't like the, the record or whatever you call him made that kill a policeman and all stuff like that, and bad thing. I don't like him. Uh, but he's a great player, and you can respect him as a ball player, but you don't have to like him as a university. Amos Alonzo Stagg, uh, uh, way before in your time, uh, I liked his philosophy of many things. A couple of statements that he made was, I never had a player I didn't love. I had a lot I didn't like, but I loved him just the same. And he said, you can never can tell whether you had a successful year until about 20 years after your players have graduated, then you'll know whether you were successful or not. That's a pretty good philosophy. Pretty good philosophy. Can I ask another question? Well, let me ask you one more. Ian? Hi, Coach. My name's Ian. I'm in the class. I was wondering how you have incorporated faith into practices and just team concept in general, and when that began. Well, I think from my early, uh, uh, early <laughs> days, going back to grade school, I think that uh, I came from a Christian family, and and uh, I think I was taught that pretty well from the very beginning. And uh, I never tried to influence my players. Uh, I like I like I let faith. Let's say religion. I didn't care what the religion they had. I said, have a religion, believe in it, believe in it, have reason to believe in it, stand up for it, but always be open-minded. And I tried to get that across. I didn't try to. to uh, say, do this because I did. Uh, on, on trips, if we were going to be somewhere on a Sunday, maybe uh, for some reason on a trip, uh, I would say, uh, uh, I, I happen to be a Protestant. I said, I'm going to church a certain place. Uh, I'm going to leave my, if I want to go with, be there. And I'd tell if they're Catholics, I would say, well, they can go to Mass if they wanted to find out for them. But I didn't say go. I said, they want to go, go. And, uh, I would know in advance which ones would and which ones wouldn't, I knew that in advance, but I, I think there again, it comes back to an uh, example. Like the words of that uh, little verse that I gave earlier, you heard that uh, no written word, no spoken plea can teach our youth what they should be, nor all the books on all the shelves, it's what the teachers are themselves. I think example works the best of all. and. Uh, so I think from example that I got from my parents and the people with whom they associated, it was just a natural progression. Uh, am I a Christian? I hope so. Uh, do I believe in the Lord? I hope so, but I'm really more concerned of whether or not he believes in me. Charles Barkley is now infamous response. I am, you know, a basketball player. I'm not a role model. And I'm curious what you think of players disattaching themselves from role modeling. He is a role model. Whether he wants to be or not, he is a role model. As a matter of fact, I think anyone in the public eye is a role model. I don't care whether it's an athlete, whether it's an actor, whether it's a, a politician, whoever it is. I think anyone in the public eye is a, uh, as a role model, and I think they have a responsibility to conduct themselves in a, in a way that would be conducive to the welfare of society as a whole. And I, 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 don't, I don't like Barclay, uh, that comment, and he did make that, and there's others that have said much the same way. I don't, I don't know. I don't, uh, I don't condone that at all. They, they are role models because they are in the public eye. And they're going to get, uh, because they are in the country, they're going to get, they're going to get, uh, well, the bad things are always going to play up, be played up against them, more so than the good things. I can tell you so many good things about many prof professional athletes that most people don't know. Uh, I know a lot of foundations have been set up to help people, and needy people that some of the athletes have set up. That, that, I mean, they're not publicized, but boy, they get in trouble. And that's highly publicized. They got to re recognize that and, and accept it. And, um, 
I, I, I'm, I'm crit a critical in my own way of, of those like Barclay that would say that. Jordan? Jordan Wilson from class. Thank you again. I have kind of a two-part question. First part is, since you think of your team athletes as individuals, do you feel your strategies also are functional on individual athletes such as figure skaters or gymnasts? And if so, what is most important for working with them? Well, in the individual athletes, it's still a team. And I think the individuals should be trying to develop themselves in the best way to do the best they can and put that to use for the welfare of the group as a whole. I was so impressed with um, our gymnastics team, uh, our women's gymnastic team, and uh, I think they've been doing a wonderful job. And I see them pulling so much for each other, and they're, they're back of each other. But it's that individual out there on the, on the beam or on the mat or whatever it is, they're on their own. And they have to work hard to develop themselves, not only for their, their, their personal uh, the acclaim, but for how that's going to do to help the team as a whole. And, and that's helped when all the team are supporting them. It takes that, the, the team support. So uh, I think uh, the, uh, there are sports that where it's individual more so than others. There is no question about that. I believe there is. Uh, but um, uh, uh, it, it, when there's a team involved, you develop your individual talents for the welfare of the team. Get them thinking that and trying to do that. And I think they'll come closer to realizing their potential. And I, just the same as I believe in teaching basketball. If I, would, if I could get across the players, uh, don't think about the score. Think about the development yourself and your ability. I think the scores are going to be more to your liking more often than not if we're just thinking about the score. And, and I would say that would be, uh, that would be the same thing. Now, now you think, uh, baseball, when a batter's up there at bat alone, is that is he in a team situation? You bet your life he's in a team situation. He may have to, have to advance the runner, he may have to lay down the bunt to advance, he may have to be hit behind the runner, he may have to get the sacrifice fly. He's got to do what's for the best of the team, and all these things of that sort. So it, 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 when there's more than one involved, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a team situation. But life is team situation. It starts in the home. It goes to the community. It spreads around, all around. We should have more of in the world. The second part of my question is, how would you deal with bad sportsmanship or bad attitude in a sport that was uh, like figure skating or gymnastics, where you can't really bench an athlete or deprive them of playing time without um, potentially taking away a whole competitive season or um, chances for competing for the year. <laughs> Not having been in that situation, it'd be hard to answer with complete uh, uh, validity. But I'd act. I, they, they might lose the season. And I, they might may reflect on me, but I, I, I wouldn't want to be associated with the constant sportsmanship, but a uh, bad sportsmanship, but I would I would try to correct it and do whatever I think I could do it. I would not want to give up too soon. No, I keep trying, but there's going to be a line of demarcation somewhere, and you've got to accept it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Coach. My name is Dan. I'm in the class here and play lacrosse here. And I was, uh, I was wondering how important it was to you personally to earn the respect of the players, or if that really was relatively unimportant as long as the team was winning. It's very important that you have the respect of the players uh, to, uh, so that they will be uh, able to compete near their level of competence. I didn't say winning, see. If they're competing with their level of competence, maybe they are going to outscore somebody. Maybe they're not. You know, sometimes that fellow, other fellow is just better than you are. There's nothing wrong with that. Never. There's something wrong when you're better and they, they outscore you. Yeah, that, that, there's something wrong when you're better. But, uh, uh, I just just on that effort to to make the most of what you have. And, uh, One of the questions from the class that we didn't get to, but you've talked quite a bit about sportsmanship, so let me ask it on behalf of the class. What do you think of running up a score? 
I don't like it, but I've been guilty of it. Uh, and, uh, I'm a little bit ashamed, uh, a little bit ashamed. I don't like to think of it as revenge. And maybe to some degree that's what it is. I can give you some particular examples. I did purposely at one time, and I'm ashamed of it, uh, when El Center came. I wanted to put a little fear in the opponents. So I let him in the first game. I, I turned him loose, so to speak. 56 points. Never again did he come close to that. And, and we could have worked it out on certain occasions, but uh, I'm ashamed of that. But I did it for a purpose back of it. I don't think it was a good purpose. I think it was a bad purpose. In retrospect, I wish I hadn't. Uh, and uh, there was an occasion where we played a team and uh, we were terribly handicapped with uh, three of my starters who were out. This is going back to high school. Three of my starters were out with measles. And we played a team that, uh, that uh, they ran up the score on us. Worst score in the, in all my career that I ever lost to, and, uh, as far as points are concerned. And uh, I remembered that. And uh, we played them again, we were healthy, and I returned the favor. <laughs> and I didn't, uh, I didn't ease up on them. I just, uh, I'd pull them for them to make more and more. <laughs> And I'm ashamed, and I, I'd say I did it. But I, I'd say those, uh, those were, uh, were younger years. Uh, and, uh, but uh, uh, you, you, may, you may remember that uh, in my later years, uh, some of you probably read about this, uh, we lost a game to Houston, the Astrodome. And uh, Al Cinder had a Vertical double vision. It had an eye problem. It had been scratched, and uh, he wasn't near near himself. And we lost him by two points, and that's fine. Um, uh, but they they talked about how what they'd do to us there mid again. It'd be a lot worse than that. So we played them. I knew we'd play them again because I thought we were the two best teams in the country. And we played them again in the semifinal in the, in the national tournament. And before I eased up, we led them by 44 points. And that wasn't very nice. And we ended up by winning 101 to 69, but it could have been worse. <laughs> and so, I, so I did ease up. But, but, again, but again, when I wanted, not because of that we'd lost to them, but because of the remarks that some of their players had made afterwards, and their coach made a remark or two that I didn't like. Uh, with the rise of violence in competitive sports, do you think the various leagues are, are doing enough to control the problem? No, I don't. No, I, I, to, for me to uh, try to give you the cure, I don't know, but I don't think enough is being done. Uh, maybe they're trying to, but I think there should be done. I, I, I think the tendency is way too much. Uh, uh, if the perpetrator is a star, the tendency is that they, they, they'll let him go ahead and, and uh, they don't take action. I, I believe that's true in a lot of cases. And I, 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 think, I think more action should be taken along that line. Uh, but I don't, I don't like to see it. I don't, I don't want basketball, for example. I don't want it to be, it isn't, it's not, it's not a non-contact game, but I don't want it to be a physical game. I want finesse and maneuverability. I want that to be. I think that's the beauty of the game. I don't like post play you see in professional, but it's a wrestling, it's not basketball. And that comes down to the collegiate uh, uh, level too, and it keeps going down. There's no question. And, and uh, um, I don't like brute strength. I don't, I don't think brute strength. Uh, I see. There is unfailing. Let's see. It's unfailing when we win by faith and not with force. That's not 100 percent true, though. I know. It's like uh, the race doesn't always go to the swift or the strong. But that's the way to bet. <laughs> if, if, you're, if you're going to bet. <laughs> Pablo. Yeah, I'm Pablo Fuentes. I'm a student in the class. Thank you for coming. Um, <clears throat> nowadays, like fans feel like the price of admission pretty much entitles them to say anything to 
they want. How do you feel, and what is your experience with uh, fans heckling players? And along the same lines, how do you feel about the talk that has been later, uh, lately about putting the students right around uh, the court in Paul Pavilion? Well, I think the fans that do that should be ejected. I definitely feel that. And I think as far as the students, uh, uh, I, I'd like to have them around, yes. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of things that have to be taken into consideration. I, 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 maybe this isn't a, a good analogy, but um, Mr. Morgan was our director of athletics the, most of the years I was here, and Mr. Johns before him. But Mr. Morgan, very, very strong athletic director. And um, um, through the years, he was a powerful person, and he scheduled us. Um, he did all the scheduling. I had nothing to say about it at all. Uh, he might ask me and then do what he's going to do but, uh, <laughs> about seeing him now. But we played uh, year after year. We're playing uh, in Chicago Stadium on Saturday night. And we uh, almost always in those years, we were playing the second game. We'd be the feature game. And uh, we're supposed to start at 9 o'clock, never get started at 9. We're always later, but late in the second game. And he had us scheduled. We always played at Notre Dame the next day at 1 o'clock for television. And um, I didn't like that. That, that. that actually at Notre Dame, you know, there's a time differential. And it's reasonably, reasonably you're playing at 12 o'clock. According to the time you're playing in Chicago, it's not 1 o'clock. It's 12 o'clock when you're... And I didn't like doing that. but was the reason for it? Television. Money from television. And what does the money from television do? Which helped our entire sports program. Mr. Morgan uh, had originally been assistant uh, uh, business manager of the university, and he knew a lot about that. He knew how, and he, he kept the UCLA athletics, and he was athletic director in the black all the time by the way he scheduled things. And, and uh, fortunately, he was fortunate in those years that we did have outstanding basketball uh, teams and, and he was able to hold up people, uh, the television people, yeah, if you want us, you can pay this. If Notre Dame knew what uh, what we were getting for those television games and what, what Notre Dame was getting, they'd been, they'd been high heavens. They didn't know. And, uh, but there was reasons for his doing I understand that. I didn't like it. And that could be the same in the situation that you brought up, too. So, yeah, but I, because the, 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 you need the support of the of the community and some of those people up there are also in the and for the basketball you're talking about now to get those seats there they also have to buy football seats you know and i don't agree with that but the, the, you you probably know that don't you to get the good seats, you got to buy football seats too so they kind of got you and uh, so but the reason you've got to there's I don't believe in appeasement, but sometimes you have to appease. <laughs> That's just about what it boils down to. But I, from a coach, a pure coaching point of view, yes, I'd like to have the student body down there. But I'll tell you, I've been a little disappointed with our student body in recent years, too. I don't like some of the things I hear, some of the yells I hear and what they're yelling at the other teams when they come out of it. I don't like it. I'd like to see them do something about it. Actually, as an extension to this, um, since I've heard you say this and I think it really has high impact, would you speak about designing the locker room when you had the opportunity to design the two locker rooms and then when you're done, you can ask and I'll well, be back in a minute? Uh, there's certain things I have to be very careful about. I don't want to, I, I, I heard Coach Lavin's feelings when they asked me uh, what I thought about the black uniforms. I said, I don't like them. Oh, you like them? <laughs> well, they, that kind of hurt his feelings, and then uh, they asked me two uh, reporters one time, "What do you think about uh, Coach Lavin getting six, seven hundred thousand dollars a year when the highest you ever got from your sale was thirty-two five? And I said, "Well, I think it's great. I'm happy for him. It's great." Well, well, I said he offered to me that. I'd take it. <laughs> I said, "Well, do you think? Well, don't you think he's overpaid?" And I said, "Yes, he's overpaid." But you don't blame him for that. I say, I think most coaches are overpaid. I, I don't think they should be making more than the president of any university, or even more possibly than the... But, so I have to be very, very careful on what I say. 
But I had something to do with the arrangement of Poly Pavilion, which has been uh, changed now. But um, and that make a difference whether I approve or not. I have been there 26 years. Oh, I've been there, but not in any active capacity. I wanted when it was built. I wanted 12 feet from the sideline to the first bleachers, from the sideline to the first bleachers, because there have been places where here's the sideline, here's people right up here. You come by to pinch you or something. <laughs> you have to you, an out of bounds ball in some places. You're throwing an out of bounds ball. In, you're standing in bounds when you throw it in from out of bounds because if there's a, and they have a, maybe a three foot line inside where you can stand and. Um, uh, so I wanted, um, I wanted uh, 12 feet on the sidelines, and I wanted 20 feet on the ends, at least 20 feet. And uh, then I wanted down to far end of the pavilion. Are you all familiar with the pavilion? Down to far end. You know the, the, the scoreboard's not over the direct middle. That, that's my fault. I wanted that far end. I wanted, you've seen that curtain that drops down? Well, we had freshman teams all the time, the die goes through. And, and I wanted to have our freshman practice at the same time and down there, and I wanted that 12-foot uh, canvas that drops down uh, to, to serve as a ball barrier and a sound barrier and a sight barrier from where the professional would be working at the same time. And they start practice half hour late on the varsity, and then when the varsity goes in, they come in and they have the main floor then to work on for half an hour. And so I got them to do that. and. Um, then I wanted the dressing rooms to be identical. For the, I wanted the visiting dressing room to be identical to the home dressing room. I thought that's important. I've gone to places where the visiting dressing rooms are, you hang your clothes up on a nail or something. And, <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and I, didn't, I never thought that was right. And I wanted them to be identical, the two. And that's not true anymore, as you know. But uh, that's all right. That's all right. I have nothing against that. If they want to do it that way, they see that's best, that's fine. And uh, don't bring the present coach for that. I think that was done before he came. And, uh, but I, I did want, I wanted the two dressing rooms to be identical. And I wanted that space at each end. And there's a lot more space at, that, at the far end. I mean, that's because of that, that, having that full court across where their freshman could practice. That made it necessary to scoot the main floor down this way a little bit so you could have them down there. That, and so that's bleacher, bleachers are farther down there. So, uh, but um, I, 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 I like that. I like that. I, I, I think we owe that courtesy to visiting teams that ought to be. I want the, I want the crowd to be, our fans, our, our student body to be loud, voices, but for your own team. For your own team, not, 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 not on the other team, for your own team. That's what I always wanted. Uh, and I like to see that. Really well. I don't like the uh, the uh, what do they call them? the the what is the Duke the crazies and they are crazy. Believe me. And that straw hat band at Cal when you're trying to warm up and the straw hat band running around the other way. And one of my players kicked a hole in their big drum and they send us a bill for it. <laughs> <laughs> we're warming up. Mr. Morgan said, I'll pay that bill. Yeah, I can't. I'll pay that bill. <laughs> yeah, my name is Bruce Hansen. I'm from Cal State Fullerton. Uh, I have a question. When you first started coaching and you had a different philosophy, mm -hmm. definitely, than the majority of coaches, what were some of the doubts that you had in your own mind, and if there were any, and how did you deal with those personally? Maybe people you went to or things you might have done. Well, I think in entering a new job, and particularly your first time, uh, like, like a teaching job, I had just as doubts in the classroom, the teaching English classes, which I always taught prior to coming to UCLA. Now, I had doubts about that. Who else? Can I do a good job? Or, you know, do this and that. And I'm worrying. And then I didn't know how to prepare my lesson plans for to be able to get the most done. And, uh, and I had the same thing about uh, teaching. Uh, a, a sports, whatever it might be. And prior to coming to UCLA, I always taught, I was always a head basketball and head baseball coach wherever I was. And, and, and also, at uh, you know, one time, I was the head tennis coach, too. And uh, as well as being an athletic director. So I had a lot of things. I had to learn to, uh, to uh, budget my time. And I didn't know how to do that. That was causing me more trouble than my, my first teaching position, is to budget my time to get all things done, to get my uh, lesson plans from English classes, to get my uh, lessons plans for the sports 
that I was teaching and, and then trying as, serving as athletic director too, trying to keep all the coaches and the other sports happy too. Uh, an athletic, that's one thing an, uh, that an athletic director has, uh, is to keep other sports happy because if, if the athletic director is coach of one sport, you've always got coach of other sports, you've got his favorite is one sport. And you've got to, you've got to get those things balanced out right. So those were the, excuse me, the current concerns that I had. And I always had them. Until I came to UCLA and I'm the basketball coach. I came here on vacation. <laughs> you might say, at Indiana State before I came here, I was the head basketball coach, I was the head baseball coach. I taught the coaching course in basketball, I taught the coaching course in baseball, I taught a, a freshman English class, I was the athletic director. And, and, and uh, I had no full-time assistance at anything, the student assistant that I could get. And I came to UCLA basketball coach. Yeah, that's what was. Didn't have much of a place to play, but that was my job. I said it was a lot different. So it was those things that I had the most concern with, and they're the things that I think learned. Oh, I'm learning more about the techniques of the game and more the techniques of teaching all along, too. But uh, 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 I think I needed more of these other things than actually the techniques of the sport in which I was teaching. Hi, um, I'm Dean. I'm a UCLA alumnus and a former staff member here in psychology. I now work in statistics as a student affairs officer. Um, my question is, um, one of the impressive things about the national championships that you've had is it happened during the 60s and 70s, which is one of the most tumultuous times in the United States with the civil rights and, uh, and the Vietnam War. How did you keep all those outside aspects out out away from the court since they were happening outside well I'm sure all the players were or and the students were going crazy during that time you have to understand the feelings of them themselves and uh, uh, but they've got to understand what your position is too as um, as Andy Hill in this uh, latest book that I worked them on, it's entitled Be Quick But Don't Hurry, which my players heard from me day after day after day after day after day. And he tells about the time that, uh, that he said, let's call off practice uh, for some reason or other. And I said, you don't have to come practice, Andy. If you don't want to, you don't have to come at all. And so he came and there was no problem. But uh, I wanted to feel that there were certain things that I might have believed in the things, but I think you've got to do or what you think is the proper thing, what you're responsible for, anything else. And, uh, uh, but you have, to, you have to be aware of all these uh, problems of society in uh, that particular area and be cognizant of them. Uh, uh, the biggest problem of an individual that I had during those tumultuous times was Bill Walton. Uh, and yet, when he came on the practice floor, you never could have any more perfect person. He worked hard on time, never a problem, great, unselfish, worked as hard as anybody. And you would think a superstar might be, be given some leeway to tell you, no, no, not with him, he never knew it with anyone. And, uh, but when he's taken over the administration building with a bunch of others, when he's lying down on Wilson Boulevard and stopping traffic, when I have to bail him out of jail, and things like that, when he's interrupting classes, signing, getting petitions signed and all those things, th those are the things. But he has a right to his political beliefs. I, I can't, I, I, I might believe in some of the things that he believed in, but I, I can't. I think when you, um, I, everybody has a right to protest, all of you, you have a right to protest. But I think when you, in your protest, you deny others their rights, I think that's wrong. And that's what I tried to get across to him. When he lay down and whistled Boulevard and stopped traffic, let's assume, as I talked to him afterwards, what if there's an ambulance in that line of traffic that was rushing somebody to the hospital? Might not get there in time, might, it might cost him life. Did you ever think about that? No, I didn't think about it. Don't you think you should? Well, maybe I should, but I didn't. But um, I think uh, when they take, take over the administration building, I said, don't you think people had work to do? And you should demand them the things that think about that. But um, he ha they have a right, and I believe in the right of protest. I believe in protesting, absolutely. And, uh, uh, but don't deny others their rights. I, I, that, that's what I'm against. That's just my feeling. You may all disagree with me, and that's your right, too. It will be a very dull, monotonous world if we all agreed on things.
I want everything. Megan? I'm Megan Badkeys. I'm part of the sports psychology teaching team. Um, thank you, Coach, for taking the time to talk to us. Um, given that uh, parents often put their children in sport because of, give them the opportunity because they feel it's of value, and then based on your experience, if you were talking to a group of you sport parents, what would you say was the value of putting their, their children in sport? I think they learn the value of working with others and sacrifice for the help of others in the most cases. I think the parents should encourage their youngsters to get in. I believe in particular team sports. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's not that I don't believe in the others too, because they do, but I believe that all parents should uh, try to get the youngsters involved in extracurricular activities that involve others. Uh, just like, you know, there's a lot of homeschooling. And uh, I think in many cases that's very good, but I think those youngsters are missing the opportunity to work with others. And I think it's different, and I, I, I'm, so I'm, 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 I don't prove it for that reason. Uh, but um, I think you should encourage them, and, but don't force them. Let them choose what they want. Don't force them in it. Don't, don't get them into a sport because you like this sport and you want them into it. They may be entirely different. I have a, a doctor friend, a very outstanding surgeon, had four sons and, uh, and a daughter. Uh, three older sons all became doctors. And the daughter, she became a doctor. And then here's the young, I had these all in my summer basketball camps, all of them. And the, young, the, young, the youngest one, he didn't want to be a doctor. And he talked to me, he said, I think my folks just want me to be a doctor. I go, I don't want to be a doctor. I don't want to be a doctor. They're all brilliant students, all, one of them. And I said, talk to your folks. Talk to your folks. I, I, know that. I know your folks. I know your mother and dad both. If you don't want to, they don't want you to. Just, they don't, don't think it's because... And, and uh, they, uh, he did talk with his folks, and I talked with his, with his folks beforehand. And, uh, and uh, he's a very successful attorney. <laughs> and uh, he's very happy, and they're very happy, and they, they, didn't, they didn't want to push him, but sometimes you do without knowing so. You get them, push them into something that you want them to do, not because they want to do. And I think you have to direct them, certainly, certainly, but uh, I think in sports, support them in something they like, support them. I believe in expose them to different things and then support what they choose to do. Not because you want them to, but because they want to. Is this attorney specializing in medical malpractice by <laughs> <laughs> Steady flow of business, yes. Um, I was wondering um, if you used, um, particularly when you had an athlete who uh, maybe was having a, a performance issue for whatever reason, you know, not being able to um, make the baskets they used to be able to, or just having a block for whatever reasons, um, or just in general, did you use visualization much? Um, there's a lot of discussion about that use now. Did you get into that with your athletes? Yes, I would, I would I'd talk with them about it. And uh, um, there are many things that can happen. Let me give you an example of a youngster that, that I had him for a um, well, he was now a freshman because freshman couldn't play. Uh, his sophomore and junior year, he, he, I thought he was much better than he was performing. He just didn't perform like I could. I, I just he was on the team and he played a lot, but he never was. And uh, uh, for some reason or other, he had one of his teammates finally <coughs> came and talked to me about him. And he said, "Do you know that his father?" calls him after every game and said, uh, how many points you score? And uh, I'm ashamed to go to work. Shame to go to work. Same with friends, because you're not doing it. And uh, I had no idea about this, but he was so tight apparently in games that this, so I, uh, I made a point to, uh, made an appointment with his mother and dad, and I went and talked to them. And, I put it on the line, pretty close to what I'd heard, what he was doing, see if he was doing that, and he admitted he had. And his wife, I could see, was on my side completely, and also he had his uncle, was happened to be there too, and he was on my side. 
And uh, I, I, I tried to explain how he's really hurting the youngster. He said, fine, fine, young man. He's doing all right academically. He's going to graduate. And he's, but as far as his playing, they are hurting him. Instead of helping him, they're hurting him. And he explained this to him the best they could. Well, he said he, he wouldn't do it, and he didn't. And the youngster had a fine year. His senior year played on a champion, national championship team. He had a real nice year. If I had known earlier, I think he would have done much better earlier had I no, I didn't know. But maybe I should know. That's something I should try to find out, but I didn't. I didn't. Another one of my goose. Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead. Um, I have one more question. It's smart. I'm going to Um What do you think about the, the media painting the picture um, of upward mobility through sport and downplaying like, like education, like to our youth? Well, I think they're, I, 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 don't, I don't like it. <laughs> uh, but they're doing it, and uh, there's some, that's along with some of the discussion we had earlier. Uh, sports are in the limelight, education isn't. Uh, youngsters uh, probably like to get into sports because they, uh, youngsters, they like to be seen, and, and, and they're going to be seen and get some, and in sports and uh, in, in, in education. Very few are going to know about that, as far as the outside public, just themselves. And, uh, but we've got to accept that in society today. I don't like the fact that uh, you would think when some of the things we read in the papers that all athletes are bad people. But they're not. The vast majority of them are good people, real good. But you don't read so much about the, what all these, uh, so many of the good ones are doing. But when the bad ones get in trouble, I'm not excusing them. I think it's terrible. And they deserve it. But you don't read. Let's have more about the good. I'm not saying less about the bad. Let's have more about the good. But when they're bad, yes. I don't think you can hide it. It's there. I don't see no reason to hide it, but my, my, I, I don't read about the many wonderful things that David Robinson does, or David Stockton does, or John Stockton, I mean, and a lot of others, but you sure know about them. Yeah. Okay, let's have... Um this one be the last. Did, unless, did you have another question? Because well, oh, let, 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 let Nicole go, and then I'll, if you do, we'll have you go. Okay. Nicole, please in the class. Professor Scanlon mentioned us, to us the other day, and I was wondering if you could tell us the significance of teaching your players how to put on their socks. Oh. I think. <laughs> 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 well, they sort of laughed about that through the years, but uh, I learned that in high school. That we had lots of blisters, and. Uh, uh, that that's hurts. You know, basketball is played on a hardwood floor, and, and uh, you just stop and start in a quick movement. That's the game. And um, I found out that a lot of them, uh, uh, not, now talk about high school, when at that time uh, they didn't, uh, we'd finish, finish some, we could do finish some socks to begin with, and then we didn't, didn't have a laundry for them, and they were, and they were doing them. And uh, I, I, my, my dear wife, she took the socks and supporters at home, and she'd you know, I'd bring them home, and she'd wash them, and on, on uh, you know, uh, uh, she keep them soft. Yeah. Yeah. And but and they'd see these socks and have holes in them and whatnot. And they they they'd, uh, come to practice, they couldn't grab the sock, pull them on, pick their shoes, and tie them up and come out. There'd be wrinkles around the little toe and around the heel where you get areas. So I started. And we'd put, we'd show them how to pull on their socks, how to, them, how to get around their little toe area here. Now hold it up and get the heels. Make sure there's absolutely no wrinkles in there. Then hold your shoe open. Don't you have it spread wide. Do it down and put it on there. Hold the sock up when you put it on. Then start at the lower spread, your each eyelet. And bring them up snug, snug, and then tight, and then double tie so they won't uh, come undone while we're practicing. And you have to stop and get a tie of shoelace or something to wind up. It's and. Uh, uh, that's to cut down blisters, and we cut down blisters. And I also found out that most, most of my players wore shoes that were too long, uh, either half, sometimes size, definitely a size uh, more. Why? Well, I think it's because when you have children, you'll find out that when you buy shoes for them, you'll get them a thumbnail too long. You'll do that. And when the foot grows into that, the shoes are worn out, so you get new shoes, thumbnail too long. They never get to wear shoes that fit them. 
so, so, uh, uh, so I think that this is a carryover that they're wearing shoes too long. And so I wanted shoes. I want their toes to come right at the end of the shoe with the socks on. And then I wanted absolutely no slippage on those quick stops or socks. Change the record, change the pace. Woo, that's the game. And I want no slipping. And uh, I, that cut down blisters immediately. It cut down blisters. When I started doing that, it would cut down blisters and that, that we're going to get better performance. You, are you familiar with Bo Bridges, the actor? He came out for basketball here and I cut him off the squad. He wasn't any good. <laughs> but he came out and uh, he likes to tell the story now. He said, I came out for basketball with coach, the freshman and Coach Wooden came to talk to all the freshmen. He said, now, young man, first thing I'm going to talk to you about is how to put on your shoes and socks. He said, here, guys, I'm going to learn something about basketball <laughs> from shoes and socks. Yeah, you know anything. Many years later, he said, I'd grown up, married, and had children. Took my son up to UCLA's basketball camp. Now that he's holding for youngsters up at California Lutheran College. He said, I wanted to go in and see if Coach learned anything in all these years. He said, so here he has said the first day he has all the parents and those that bring the children set up in the stands and he has the youngsters out on the floor and he talks to the parents and then he turns to the young player and says, sit down, young man. Now, first thing I'm going to show you how to do is put on your shoes and socks. He, he hadn't learned a thing in all these years. He said, <laughs> hadn't, hadn't, hadn't learned a thing. But, but I think it's a little thing, but it's important. But I do believe it's the little things that make things happen. Uh, I, I think it's the little head fake that'll help you get open. I, I think it's, the, it's the, the, the fake step here that'll help you get open. I think it's knowing how to start quickly. I think it's throwing this arm that makes you... Yeah, the little things. I think you rebound because you get your hands up here. Now if you come down in here and somebody gets close to you, then you bump and you can't get up. Get them up here. The ball's going to come from up there. Start coming down here. Get up there. <laughs> and uh, the little things, all the little things like that. I think it's the little things that make the big things come about. And uh, uh, I, I think I, I, the, kid, the kids still laugh at me about it and they still talk about it. But nevertheless, I... Showed them how to put on their shoes and socks to make it easier. And uh, my mind, at any rate, it helps us cut down on blisters. And uh, if I believe it, it's a good thing to do, you know. Okay, um, actually, okay let, let's do this one last one. Uh, my name is Andrew, I'm an alumnus, and you've talked a lot today about all the pressure on student athletes. And I wanted to ask you two questions about the immense pressure today on, on coaches. Um, the first is with the theater of controversy that's been surrounding Steve Lavin for two years. What does a coach do when he finds that he himself is distracting his players from the goals he's trying to steer them towards? Forget it. Forget it. Don't let it get you. If you can't take criticism, get out. Yes, yes. Yep. What is it? Uh, what is it Truman said? If you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. Um, that wasn't not good. I was very disappointed in our director of athletics, incidentally, um, about contacting uh, Patino. And I thought that was very bad judgment on his part. But I thought Steve handled things very well. I think, and I think that I think that's the best thing that ever happened to him. I think it brought his team together. I really believe it brought his team together at a point when they weren't all that together. I think that was a, a at least it was a contributing uh, factor on on bringing them together. But coaches, if coaches are going to be worried about pressure, I said from the very beginning, find something else. If you think you're not going to have pressure as a salesman, go and be a salesman for a while. If you think you're not going, if you're a barber, you're not going to call all the hair in town. No. You, no matter what you are, the butcher is not going to sell all the meat. There are going to be other fellows too. You're under pressure. Any person, if Tara isn't putting pressure on herself, do a good job. She's cheating herself and cheating all those under supervision. You have to put pressure on yourself. Do a good job. And if you're concerned and worried about the pressure in the particular profession you're in, you should try another profession where maybe there would be uh, different types of outside pressures or maybe no outside pressures in some, but you always must put pressure on yourself. You must. If you don't put pressure on yourself, you're cheating. You're cheating. You're cheating in others and you're cheating yourself. Uh, most of all, always you have to be 
putting pressure to, to, to try to do the best job that you're doing, and nobody can do more than that. But if you're worried about it, if a coach is worried about what the alumni think, if he's worried about what the, uh, the, uh, the media thinks, if he's worried about the parents of his players think, or what the girlfriends think, if he's worried about all those things, he's not going to be doing the job of which he's capable of doing. I, I, I was really pleased to see we Steve uh, worked that situation out. I thought he did a good job, and I, I think they, I really, in retrospect, feel that it brought his team together more so, which I personally glad to see. I, I want to see him do well. And, uh, uh, he, Steve's had a pretty tough job. He's paid well for it, but it's been a pretty tough job. <laughs> you know, he, he didn't have a good background, you know, when he came in. He'd never been a... Uh, I don't believe Steve had ever been even a second assistant. I'd no higher than a third assistant. That's tough to throw in this job when you're under the, the eye for him. And I think that I, I, I think Steve's done better every year. It pleases me. I want to see him do well. And I think we're going to do real well this year. We're going to do real well. we, we, it's possible we can go all the way this year. I really think it's possible. I'm not saying we should. No. I'm saying we're one, one of the few that could go all the way. I think we're going to have a real good year. Uh, I, I, I said it would have been a lot tougher if all of Arizona's players hadn't <laughs> left them. <laughs> they, they, lost, you know, they lost four starters that they expected to have back. And uh, the one that graduated and the other four. But they'd have been tough. But now that's, that's going to make it very tough for them. And I think uh, I wouldn't trade our chances with anybody. I like the coaching. <laughs> <laughs> and, and one practice session you're reserving, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much.